Hello once, hello, once again, it's Peter Cowley here, Project Cancer. First time I've done a Zoom recording of the podcast, so you'd have to excuse me if I get something wrong here. And the guest today is Kat Arney. Now, I met Kat because some years ago, many years ago, about 10 years ago, I was asked to do a tech slot on a program here in Cambridge, Chris Smith, uh, who is the founder um, on, uh, which is called The Naked Scientists. And Kat, as a freelancer, I suspect, was a, my interviewer, was a producer, actually, on the programme, and occasionally interviewed. And we used to have great fun on that. I did about probably six or seven with Kat and probably another 20 with other people. So, but Kat has, the reason we I've got Kat on here, because Kat, I noticed Kat had written a book called The Rebel Cell. And I read this, fascinated by it, taking a whole load of notes from it, which Kat's seen, and I really want, and, and of all the people I know in terms of both knowledge and communication skills, Kat is the best I've found. So Kat, I'm sorry, I've probably bigged you up a bit too much there. Uh, over to you to talk talk this through. So the idea is that uh, we learn a bit about your background and then you talk through your book and I will interrupt and, and guide the direction, finish it all in about 25 minutes. So thank you, Kat. Super. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I do do quite a lot of public speaking, public talks about my book, so you may just wind me up and let me go at this point. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear your insights and your thoughts as well, Peter, as we go through. But briefly, yeah, my history is I'm a scientist by training, so I did my degree and my PhD at Cambridge. My PhD is in developmental biology, uh, developmental genetics and epigenetics, this was before epigenetics was the hot cool thing. And um, I've always been really fascinated by this scientific question of how, like, how do you make life happen? How do we go from, in, in the context of development, you know, one single cell, one cell, a fertilized egg to a baby? I was like, ah. Oh. That's that's mind blowing. I think it's the most incredible question in science. You know, people get very excited about stars and galaxies and all these kinds of things. But I just think this simple process of life unfolding is magical. Well, it's, it's not magical, it's scientific. So yeah. we should try and understand it. Um, and that took me then to um, I did you know a couple of short postdocs as a researcher and then went to work at Cancer Research UK as a science communicator. So I started that in 2004. I was there for 12 years and a whole range of science communication roles. And then also as how you and I met Peter, I was freelancing as a science writer, as a, a radio presenter, podcaster, broadcaster. And then by 2016, I'd uh, made the leap to become a freelance. I brought my first book out called Herding Hemingway's Cats, which is all about how genes work. You know, we hear about genes all the time, but how do they actually do that? How how does a gene manifest as like a living thing? Which is kind of the question I've always been interested in. How does this this code, the ACs, Ts and Gs, this molecule, the double helix that we see all over the place from shampoo ads to science buildings, like how does that work? Um, and from there, that really launched a career as a science writer, a broadcaster. I've made some documentary series for Radio 4, exploring our genes. I've um, you know, done, done a whole range of things. I'm now the host of the Genetics Unzipped podcast. That's for the Genetic Society. And also run a science communication agency. We're called First Create the Media. And we work with life sciences companies ranging from small startups all the way through to you know, large multinational companies, helping them tell the stories about their science, their ideas, the ideas that are changing the world. How do we communicate those to the public? And then in, yeah, in 2020, a couple of years ago now, uh, right in the middle of pandemic, I brought <laughs> out my most recent book, which is Rebel Cell, Cancer, Evolution and the Science of Life. Yes, and that's how I found it. So when was it launched? That's in COVID. So it was just sort of yep. june or july or something august august, august of the pandemic august 2020 uh that yeah. was crazy i had to do the proofreading of the, the the proof copy had to do all of that proofreading in that kind of crazy time like march april during lockdown when everyone was just shot and yeah. as i was going on and i had to try and focus and also my company we were working with uh, an organization called Zoe, a company called Zoe, oh, who no, did yeah, the Zoe COVID study. Right. So all the time, all day long, we were suddenly just churning out all this stuff about COVID, 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 COVID. And then I had to sit down and try and proofread this book about cancer um, that came out at a time when, you know, there was only one life threatening disease on the block and it was not yeah, cancer at the time. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it was for many. Probably exactly. Worse. 
exactly. Yeah. So talk me through the book. You know, you obviously you explain why you've written it, and it's for the audience is it's fairly technical in places, but it's not too technical, so it's for the masses effectively. I hope. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope I've, I've threaded a bit of a better needle. With with my first book, I was just so excited about trying to explain molecular biology that I think it did get quite technical in places. This book, I hope I've done a better job of really explaining, of placing cancer in an evolutionary context, which is what I wanted to do. And I wanted to really make people see cancer as a, a, as a biological phenomenon, as something that is actually inherent to our biology. So like I said, I did my PhD in developmental biology. I've always been fascinated how we go from one cell, a fertilized egg cell, that becomes two cells, four cells, eight cells, a tiny ball of cells. It becomes an embryo. It becomes a, a baby, whether that's a baby human or mouse or frog or, or fruit fly or plant, you know, whatever it is. This process of life unfolding from one cell and I was very lucky that I did my PhD in the Gurdon Institute in Cambridge, named after John Gurdon, the incredible Nobel laureate. And what was special about that institute was that on the top floor, there was all of us developmental biologists trying to understand how you go from one cell to lots of cells in a controlled way. And then on the ground floor, it was all the cancer biologists. And they were all trying to understand how you go from one cell to two cells to four cells to make a tumor mm. so we've got all these scientists trying to understand how how life unfolds in the right way and then how malignancy malignant life cancer unfolds in the wrong way because you realize these are the same processes this is the same biology it's the same genes and in the case of you know development those genes are working right, they are controlled. And in the process of cancer, they are wrong. Mm. And one of the, the key things I wanted to get across in the book is that we can sort of fall into the trap of thinking that cancer is a modern disease and it's a human disease. It's something that we've brought about by our, you know, our poor choices, our toxic lifestyle, pollution, all these things that we do as modern humans that give us cancer. Mm in inverted commas. And actually looking, you start to see that everywhere we look, we see cancer because cancer is just aberrant cell proliferation. You could see cancer all the way across the animal kingdom. This really blew my mind. I had not realized that one of the books I used to as background research when I was writing my book is a, a book about cancer evolution and it has pages, an entire chapter, pages and pages and pages of all the different species where we have examples of cancer, everything from sharks to birds to fish to wallabies, bongos, you know, all these kinds Sponge, of things. Sponges I noticed somewhere. In that, well, yeah. Sponges are a weird one because sponges yeah. are very resistant to cancer and also comb jellies, um, which are a type of jellyfish. We're not, not quite a jellyfish uh, for the pedants, but there's a very, very few species where we have known, known examples of cancer. Um, even in naked mole rats, which are the kind of the poster child for cancer mm. resistance, um, if they live long enough, they can get cancer. And so the fact that you find cancer so widely across the animal kingdom, you can even find examples of cancer in something called a hydra, which is like, it's a tiny tube with tentacles. It only has three types of cells in it. And in 2014, researchers found a naturally occurring cancer in one of these hydra. And it's like, this tells you that this goes deep. Mm -hmm. And the fact that when we look back in the fossil record, you can find examples from dinosaurs, from fossils that are millions and millions of years old. And mm -hmm. certainly, you know, um, human remains going back tens of thousands of years, we can find examples, validated examples of cancer. Mm -hmm. and so this tells you that, that cancer is a deep evolutionary phenomenon we find it across life and we find it back in time yep. and that is because it's the byproduct of multicellularity yes and this is like the concept that i really wanted to to get across that if you're just a single cell if you're just an amoeba or a bacteria kind of doing your thing swimming yeah. about on your own you got you got no problems yeah. you're like well yeah. someone might eat you that's a problem but you've you don't have any other cells to think about. It's just you. You are your own unit, eating, reproducing, doing your thing. As soon as multicellularity evolves, cells have to decide what are we going to do 
Some of us are going to do this job. Are we even as simple as are we going to be on the outside or the inside? Are we going to be digesting cells? Are we going to be sensing cells? Are we going to be attack cells? Are we going to be reproductive cells? This key distinction between the cells that are basically the disposable body and the cells that are the immortal germline. And all of these decisions start to become encoded in genes. And this evolves, multicellular life evolves from little kind of loose collectives of cells to the incredibly organized bodies that we see across multicellular life today. It took three billion years, uh, so that's how long it took. But um, it, it's really phenomenal. But with this multicellularity, you need to have rules, you need to have organization. Again, this is all encoded in the genes. But when you start to get changes in those genes, and we call them mutations, alterations. Some of these are caused just by the internal processes of life, breathing, metabolizing, re, uh, copying your DNA. All of this stuff actually causes damage to your genes. And is the gene that... is several billion uh, cells, oh, sorry, yeah, base pairs, isn't it? Well, the whole genome so the, the human yeah. genome, like all the DNA that's yeah. found in a cell is, is a human genome, and that has all your genes. Humans have yeah. about 20,000-ish genes, and then quite a lot more control elements yeah. encoded in our DNA. You can think of these as control switches that turn genes on and off at the right time, in the right place, to do the right thing. Yeah. But if there are any errors or mutations, changes in the genes or in the switches, then cells can kind of go wrong. And it's this process of cells going wrong enables them to kind of break the rules around them. So I so I don't want to be an outside cell anymore. I don't want to be a digesting cell anymore. I just want to be free. I just want to proliferate, do my own thing. And it's this conception of cancer as a, a disease of multicellularity that emerges out of multicellularity, that emerges from cells picking up genetic changes and being able to like evolve in a tissue um to to cheat you know to to break the rules of the the, but society the, immune, around the them. immune system is there to try and kill these off isn't it yeah and that's the thing is normally the immune system's very good anything that looks a bit dodgy um mm -hmm. the immune system can normally pick that up and, and get rid of it but the problem with cancer is that obviously the cancers that grow and survive we don't know how many cancers arise in our body on maybe a daily basis that are just mopped up because they're so small, the immune system's on top of it. This immune surveillance, we call it. But by, you know, by definition, the cancers that have managed to grow must be the ones that have figured out how to evade the immune system. And it's, it's a very hard challenge because cancers start from our own cells. They're not like a bacteria or a virus that looks very different. They're our own cells. And they're very good. Cancer cells are very good at sort of fooling the immune system, tricking the immune system. They they sort of switch off the little handshakes that cells do that go, are you normal? Are you not normal? Are you dodgy? They're, they're almost like masters of disguise going like, no, I'm nothing to see here, officer. I'm completely normal cell. Yeah. Um, or they'll start co-opting cells around them or the environment of the tissue around them kind of co-opting and corrupting it. And so that's that's basically why once cancers have started to grow and spread, um, you know, it's very difficult for the immune system to handle them without help. And so this is why we now need yeah, to treat. And, the, and we have a whole range of treatments, um, including now immunotherapies as well. Yeah, yeah we'll come to that in a minute. But I do remember in the book you saying that it, the new single cell by itself probably won't necessarily form into anything bigger. But it needs to get, as you say, co-op them in. It needs to be in a warm position, or well, not warm is the wrong term, but somewhere where it's got food and everything else. So, so it needs an ecosystem that it has to grow. So a single cell probably won't survive. But so how does that happen? Do they attract each other or do they create each other? Yeah. So there's there's some this concept of kind of niche construction. And this is a concept from ecology. And this is another aspect of where the thinking is starting to go with cancer nowadays is thinking about the ecology of cancer within the body. So not just as a, an external, almost external disease, like an infection that just starts, grows, spreads. It's There's, there's an ecology, there's the micro environment mm. of the tissue in which it arises, the immune system, which immune cells are there? Are they switched on or are they being suppressed? Is it a toxic environment? And as cancer cells proliferate, they can manipulate their environment to make it nicer for them 
less nice for the other cells. They can send out signals that go around the body to like lay the, the way for them to go and spread into different niches. Um, and there's some incredible, one of the most fascinating things is um, send, they send out these little packages called exosomes, tiny little packages of like bio, biological molecules that will set up little niches, almost like sending a parcel ahead if you're gonna go on a trip. And so then when the cancer cells arrive in this other lo location, it's like, oh, this is all set up for us, lovely. We'll uh, we'll set up home here and so start another tumor. That's metastasis, that's And that is metastasis, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is what doctors call metastasis is when cancer has started to spread around the body. And this is basically, at the point at which this is happening is where you, you really have a problem because at this point, by the time, even by the time a cancer is noticeable, and certainly by the time it's spread, it is millions upon millions upon millions of cells. And it's probably been there for a while. And this comes to another really key concept that I wanted to get across in the book. And that's this concept of cancer evolution. Now, this isn't evolution in the kind of going back millions and millions of years, the evolution of life on Earth. This is that within the body, from the point at which a cancer starts to grow, that one cell becomes two cells, becomes four cells. Those cells are evolving. Each of those cells can pick up new changes, new alterations that gives it maybe new properties, maybe more useful or maybe less useful properties that allow it to adapt to the environment in which it's finding itself and the environment in which that it's constructing for itself. And so we get this concept of what um, scientists call tumor heterogeneity. And that means that by the time a cancer has really started to grow and spread, the cells are quite different from each other. It's almost like, you know, different individuals of a, of a species. You know, not all blackbirds are the same. Not all dogs are the same. They have evolved and, and picked up their own characteristics. And this is what makes cancer particularly challenging to treat once it is advanced, mm -hmm. because each of these like little pockets of cells that are genetically different may have the the genetic tools within them to resist a particular treatment but they're also resisting immune therapy because you'd have thought if it changed again it might still trigger the immune system but clearly not but from what you're saying or maybe yeah, not all, ex some of them do but some don't so. yeah so i mean can cancer as a whole is very very good at evading the yeah. immune system um so we're i've just been currently making a three-part documentary series for radio four about the past present and future like loosely based on the book but one of the things that i didn't really go into a, a lot of detail in in my book was about immunotherapy because it's it's such a huge topic you know you could do <laughs> you could do a whole book about that and uh dan davidson has actually done quite a lot of books about the immune system and, and immunotherapy but yeah as as um there are now ways, some drugs that we have called immunotherapies that can kind of unmask mm. cancers to the immune system. They, they're sort of like, it's over there, it's over there. Um, or they manipulate the environment to allow cancer cells to recognize and attack, um, allow immune cells to recognize and attack cancer cells. But the problem is they, they don't work for everyone. Mm. So the cancer cells can evolve to put their disguises back on again. They evolve different disguises. Some cancers just aren't sensitive to that kind of immune, um, you know, that kind of immunotherapy in the first place, they've evolved a, a different set of changes in them. So this is really the big challenge. This is the same challenge with the new cancer drugs that we have. Um, this is why lots of researchers now are trying things like different combinations, combinations of drugs that work in different ways, combining with radiotherapy or immunotherapy and certainly with surgery for, for cancers that are operable. Yeah, it's about kind of coming at all angles um, yeah, to I, find I, a thing that works. As you know, I mean, and maybe other people know I'm an investor and I saw, though I've stopped investing recently, I saw a pitch for NK cells the other day. Mm. Normal <laughs> cells. So we won't go to the depth of detail, but it just shows how much work's going on in all kinds of different ways uh, yeah. to combat this, this, this disease. It's incredibly uh, exciting. The, the edges of immunotherapy are fascinating and things like cell therapies now. So the, the hot cell therapy at the moment is called CAR T cells. These are chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So you take T cells, these are the attacking cells of the immune system, and then you basically put into it uh, like a kind of a, a module that recognizes cancer cells. 
and then yeah. the T cells can kill the cancer cells. But there are natural killer cells that you can also engineer in this way, these, these NK cells. Um, and then there are other types of receptors, T cell receptors that work in different ways. And then even getting rid of the cells altogether and just having these drugs that like one bit of the drug sticks to the T cell, one bit of the drug sticks to the cancer cell and just brings them together. So the, the whole field of immunotherapy, having gone from nowhere like 20 years ago, is, is the hottest of hot topics in what cancer, about, I'd say now. I was at a dinner with a friend who's uh, invested as well and uh, uh, talking about this company somewhere in the States that's looking at a universal vaccine. That seems the holy grail, but let's ignore that. Is it possible to have vaccines against a mm. cancer? I suppose it would have to be a cell type, wouldn't it, rather than a cell, rather than uh, uh, all cancers. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, I am very, very suspicious of any treatment or approach that says it works for all cancers because cancers are each each cancer is as unique as the person it arises in at a fundamental level like it's a genetic singularity it's a unique event um no one person's cancer is like any other person's cancer there are commonalities certainly you know this is why we're quite good at treating some not so good at treating others you know there's a lot of commonalities between breast cancers a lot of them are sensitive to hormone therapy which is why hormone therapy works for many women with breast cancer but not all but I'm very very suspicious of anything that's like this is the one thing for all cancers that immediately sets my quackery detector off well, yeah exactly. um, that, that's the same for me and that's the same for the guy sitting next to me but... yeah but the, the cancer vaccine, already... uh, yeah, I just I yeah. just want to come back to the cancer yeah, vaccine sure. idea. So, I mean, so some people are like, what? so this term cancer vaccine, I think we're going to hear a lot more about, and particularly in the light of the revolution there's been in mRNA vaccines for COVID, like mm -hmm. the success of the COVID mRNA vaccines has really opened up this whole therapeutic avenue and certain public acceptance of like, oh, mRNA vaccines, they're very modifiable, they're very uh, adaptable, they work. Um, and this idea of a cancer vaccine is not a vaccine that would prevent you from getting cancer, but it's one that would be designed to enable your immune system to recognize your cancer. And that, again, is the fundamental problem that immune systems don't recognize cancer because it looks too much like us. But there are, you know, there are differences. And like I said, that cancer cells have managed to sort of suppress the immune response. So this is more like a, a training guide it's like it's training the immune system to learn to recognize cancer cells. That must be a specific type of cancer, so it's all types of cancer, is that right? Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. there's not as far as I'm aware any one, you know, one the cancer molecule that's present on all cancer cells. So I think, you know, a universal anti cancer vaccine, unless I'm mistaken if, if anyone does no, know no, I would be happy to hear but certainly these ideas would be they'd be more um more personalized or at least in kind of broader buckets are there uh, other vaccines already that's been accepted and be in use for can cancer yet or not so not for, not for treating cancer so no. this is the idea of treatment vaccines yeah. which are effectively immunotherapy I think the word yeah. vaccine is very misleading because it makes you think of preventing yeah. now it's important to point out actually that around one in five cancers worldwide is actually caused by infections infectious yeah. diseases yeah, that, the yeah. one that we do know about uh, the one that most people know about is HPV human papillomavirus that causes cervical cancers and other cancers of, of like the mouth and the throat and other um, anogenital cancers now we do have a vaccine that stops people from getting HPV and it is used it's rolled out to school children in the UK and many other countries and the data coming in now this has been going for a um, you know good sort of 10 years that this is this is transformative that this is basically going to, if we can get a good program of vaccination against HPV, you could eradicate cervical cancer. Mm. And that's like, that's a, that is yeah. absolutely incredible. And there's other disease, you know, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV in certain parts of the world is associated with things like lymphoma, um, head and neck cancers, the helicobacter pylori, the, the um, stomach ulcer bug, that's associated with stomach cancers. So actually controlling these infections uh, the reason we don't hear about them because they're not such a big problem in the uk except for cervical cancer but controlling these infections worldwide would actually make a big difference to cancer rates in, in many parts of the world but um 
you know, yeah. in the UK, most of our cancers are not caused by infections. So we're, we're more focused on other things. Yeah, one, one thing that I found quite frightening was this transmissibility of cancer. Ah, so, yeah. Tasmanian devils. I mean, <laughs> that, if you look at it in terms of a sort of Daily Mail or something headline, it, it could be pretty frightening if that, that people are worried. I mean, airborne, airborne transmission of cancer, that's not at the moment possible, is it? <laughs> yeah, so this... It's kind of a bit of a sidebar, but I find it fascinating because it really highlights some of the the evolvability of cancer. And that's another theme that comes through in the book is like any any evolution, any evolutionary adaptation, cancer is trying it. You know, can, there's evidence that like cancer cells can have sex, like they'll they'll fuse together and like pop out little babies that are resistant to, to treatment. Um, they will do all sorts of things. They can plumb themselves back into the bloodstream they can wire themselves into the brain and the transmissible cancer phenomenon is absolutely fascinating um i think it's important to say we do not know of any cancers in humans uh that you can catch you can't catch cancer off someone when i was looking through there are some examples in the literature where there has been transmission of cancer cells between people um the reason that this doesn't usually happen is because our immune systems are generally very good and you know, we, they're not very good at recognising our own cancer cells, but they're very good at recognising foreign things. And foreign things like cancer cells from other people, uh, they do tend to mop up. But there's a there's a few, um, and it's definitely worth reading that chapter in the book if people are interested. There's some, some really fascinating real life examples um, that, I, that I picked up and some t- um, some really uh, some terrible examples. Yeah. But yeah, the Tasmanian Devils yeah, story yeah. Is, is really interesting. It's this facial tumour that's transmitted by biting. Um, dogs as well, super interesting. It's a, a venereal tumour that's transmitted by dogs having sex. Um, but the, the biology of these things is is incredible and fascinating. I think actually the, the dog cancer is, may, can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's like the oldest living organism at this point. It's, you know, it's it's over 10,000 years old. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, just still going. And it's got 19 million mutations, as you put yeah. it in the book. So let, let's end, we've got about five minutes left. Let's end on a more positive note, <laughs> which is the future, where it's going. I mean, the uh, man, although it makes a lot of mistakes in the world, so we know in terms of climate change and everything else, we've also got the ability to invent and be innovative to uh move us to the point possibly where cancer is at least not uh, not eradicated not a deadly disease when because dementia and diabetes and everything else will get in the way of our longevity so talk through what you're seeing if you i'm, I'm an entrepreneur i'm sorry an investor so i'm looking at stuff that's five and ten years out which you know i invest in something and it might not get to you or me for 10 years what sort of things can you think of that you're seeing that is encouraging here well, I think if you're coming at this with an investment hat, um, there's, a, there's a bit where I'm a bit like, mm, I don't think I have the news for you that you want, because actually, there's so much more that we must be doing to use the treatments that we already have in a cleverer way. So one of the people I went to speak to is Bob Gattenby down in Florida. Um, he's at the the Moffitt Cancer Center down in Florida. And what he and his team are using is something called adaptive therapy. And this is based on evolutionary principles of kind of controlling cancer and, and treating it on its on its kind of evolving growth schedule. So using drugs that already exist. And he's managed to improve survival for these are advanced prostate cancers, you know, by years compared to what the the typical progression would be. You know, if this if this was a new drug, it would be front page news. But because it's just changing the dosage and the way that we use existing drugs, no one's interested because investors aren't interested because this isn't a new drug that you can chuck a load of money in. This is this is a new idea for using the drugs we have. And the same goes for things like combinations. Um, using better combinations, really strategic timing, getting exactly the right drug with the right mechanism of action at the right time for the right patient and these kind of schedules of dosing and and timing. So I think that's an important thing to watch. Um, I do think like um, some of the really exciting things are happening in cancer detection, early diagnosis. So these blood tests, we call them liquid biopsies. There's a big company called Grail that's um, doing like sort of a multi-cancer blood test that's currently being tried trialed in the NHS, which is um, very interesting. But if you were an investor and you were like, where am I going to, where am I going to put my money? The things that I think are quite exciting are um, immune engagers. So these are the kind of the 
the treatments that I said. I, I think cell therapies are quite exciting, but logistically they're very hard. It's very hard to make these things scale. And at the moment they need to be quite personalized, quite tailored. They cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, the logistics are difficult getting cells out of people, engineering them, putting them back in. So I think that the era of cell therapy, unless something radically transforms it to make it scalable, um, I think is going to be bypassed by this era of um, immune engagers. So these are soluble drugs they, that have like, you know, a bit that sticks to a cancer cell and a bit that sticks to an immune cell and brings the two together. Okay. So I think um, there's also a whole area of what we call ant uh, antibody drug conjugates, and so uh, one of the companies we're working with by Victrix up in the north, they've got a really exciting technology where they're finding kind of pairs of faulty molecules that are present just on the cancer cells. So this is the thing is that if you want to avoid side effects, you just need to be targeting cancer cells, not other cells. So they make antibodies that recognize pairs of things that are just on cancer cells because that's obviously increasing your chances that this pair is only going to be on a cancer cell and then they take they bring in like um with an antibody it brings in like this toxic payload so there's there's a lot of companies really interested in these these adcs and i think the combination going forward of you know some of the drugs we've already got some you know hormone therapies some of the treatments we already have combined with things like ADCs, combined with immunotherapies, immune engagers, um, some ways of like manipulating the immune environment, the micro environment of tumor cells. Can we make it more amenable for immune cells to survive an attack in there? Um, yeah. So I think these these are the kind of the areas that I yeah. personally so that, think Matt, I, I'm, I might have mentioned to you when we last spoke, I'm on a TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which isn't quite the same as you're suggesting, but it's very specifically aimed at the mutation I have and stops it multiplying and therefore it just dies off over time, which is doing so far subject to each three monthly scan extremely well at the moment. Yeah, uh, I was exactly. Actually... Using those, sorry, you, yeah. using those, it, it's using those drugs in combination with others at the right time in yeah. the right place. Yeah, I actually, I wasn't in, in meaning an investor lens, but thank you very much for that. I was meaning really, if your knowledge, if you were to look forward five or 10 years, are you, um, uh, what's the word, positive about progress? You know, are we going to be finding the, the number of people dying from cancer, not suffering, that might not change because of the way the software bugs in the system will still create bad cells, but dying from it, is that going to be re continue to reduce, do you think? Yeah, and I'm a lot more optimistic than I was, I think, even five years ago when I really conceived the idea for the book. I mean, I've been sitting on the idea for this book for a long time, even when I was at Cancer Research UK, and I was really kind of waiting for the field to evolve to this point. I've seen the way I've seen the technologies evolve, um, our understanding of like, not just like the DNA in cancer cells, but now other techniques that we could look at the proteins, the molecules, a much better way of um, understanding what cancer is at a fundamental biological and molecular level, I think is exciting. I think liquid biopsy, being able to detect the, the DNA that's shed into the bloodstream from cancer cells is going to be transformative. Uh, the challenge there is if you're kind of doing a blood test on someone and it's like, yeah, it looks like you might have this kind of cancer. Like, okay, um, now, now no, what? Um, you've yeah. still got to you find it. You've still got to work out what kind of cancer it is. But it, we're really going to see blood tests being used to monitor cancer, to, well, diagnose cancer, um, monitor cancer, monitor the effects of treatment, monitor the evolution. Is the treatment working? Is this cancer changing? Do we now need to switch it up again? So informing these intelligent treatment strategies, I think blood tests, getting those right is going to be the key and transformative. Yeah, I and then I do... I do think that the the treatments that are coming through, um, the much more targeted treatments, the immune therapies, um, some of the the drugs like like you're on the kind of the the targeted treatments, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, using them really specifically in the right time, in the right place, but being careful that we're not just encouraging the evolution of cancer cells that are resistant to them, or at least knowing what do we do next. Um, and there's some exciting trials. One of the companies we work with is AstraZeneca, and they're developing drugs that kind of not just shut down one signaling pathway, but at the same time, shut down the most likely route of evasion uh -huh. that cancer cells will also go. So sort of a double pronged attack. Um, so you yeah. know, not just blocking the, the river, but like blocking the most likely roundabout route that the cancer will go as well. So you know, I I think maybe 
sort of five, five, six, seven years ago, we were seeing all these targeted therapies coming through. It was the first era of these really targeted therapies designed to attack the 40 molecules on cancer cells. And they were giving incredible results. But these were not durable, sustainable responses. Like, you know, they were lasting weeks, months, and then the cancer was coming back and it had evolved resistance. And then that treatment would no longer work because you're effectively like putting a Darwinian selective pressure on all the cells that are resistant and now they can yeah. grow. So I, and back then I was like, God, these drugs are so expensive and everyone's designing them and that just that everything's becoming resistant. Why are we doing this? Um, and I think now that we understand a bit more about the mechanisms behind resistance, how it evolves, how it emerges, understanding cancer as an evolutionary system within the body and having the tools to monitor it. Now, you know, liquid biopsy has only really become possible in the, the past couple of years because of the sensitivity of the technology we have. So I'm, I'm genuinely much more positive. And then also seeing the huge progress in things like immunotherapies, antibody drug conjugates, um, these kinds of things. I, uh, I genuinely am a, a lot more hopeful and I, and I certainly need to be because, you know, as, as you're all too aware, this is cancer is a very common disease um, mm. that, you know, the people, the people that we love, mm. um, I like to have them around as, as long yeah, as possible. Yeah, yeah. And those who are suffering obviously would as well. Yeah, two things on that. One, the it was a liquid biopsy rather than a, uh, a sample that they took for the lung that actually detected the uh, the cancer originally or got the mutation. Secondly, I uh, discussed at length with my oncologist whether instead of scans, they should be having blood tests on a regular basis. His view is that until it starts growing, there won't be enough DNA, i.e. the sensitivity to do a liquid biopsy. And thirdly, I am in the process of waiting for something to go wrong and it to, to mutate away from my current drug. And so anything that only to happens to be manufactured by AstraZeneca as well. So I think I perhaps ought to talk to AstraZeneca about what's next, because from where I'm going, the mutation is likely to lead to about six different uh, type, new types of cell. And from there, there's just trials from that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I, yeah, I, you sort of you mentioned clinical trials there, and, and it's it's so important that and and I'm yeah incredibly grateful as we all should be to everyone who takes part in a clinical trial. And um, I think clinical trials also need to change because the very standard way of doing clinical trials of like you got one group of patients they get this drug, you got another group and they get a different drug or the placebo. Like this doesn't really work with our more sophisticated understanding of cancer either. So you know I think. There's there's a lot of things that are changing slowly, and I, I hope that they start to change faster. Yeah, and there's massive ethical issues, no doubt, around there. I hear that you don't do a placebo against a, a trial. You always put something into the patient, not a placebo. Nowadays, tends to, yeah. Anyway, must stop there. We could talk for another half hour, but we, you know, the podcast will be too long then. So I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode. I've learned a huge amount from Kat during the last half hour or so. So thank you very much. Thank it's been Kat. a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much for having you. me.